Thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, and in the next uh, few minutes, I'd like to share with you a little bit of my path um, and, and my career uh, through some slides that um, I put uh, together for you. Um, so as uh, Bob said, I was born in uh, Bogota, Colombia. My first language uh, is Spanish. And when I finished high school, I um, won a scholarship by merit uh, to do my international uh, baccalaureate in Mbebane, Swaziland, in Southern Africa. I was the first uh, student from Colombia in that college. We were 350 students from 72 different countries. After I finished my IB, I uh, went to Mexico City where I studied medicine, um, and then I did my residency in general surgery. Uh, before I came to the United States to do my first fellowship in hand and microsurgery in Louisville, Kentucky, followed by my second fellowship in transplant surgery at the NIH. Um, my first job as a faculty was at Emory, and then I came to Duke, and I have been here at Duke uh, for the last five years. And uh, I brought what I collected through my experiences to this country. And I think it has been my capacity to reorient that has helped me to orient my career. So I've always been interested in research. I like understanding things and using the scientific method to answer questions. And my last year of medical school, I chose uh, to do a year of research in immunology and rheumatology. Um, and I did it at the National Institute of Medical Sciences uh, in Mexico City. And on Fridays was my, the multidisciplinary meeting uh, where um, complex cases will, will come to the disciplinary uh, conference. And I saw a very lovely woman in her mid-60s coming with her uh, daughter uh, with very severe rheumatoid arthritic uh, deformities in the knees, in the hips, and in the hands. And at that time, um, kidney transplants were being done routinely. Uh, the patients were, these patients were on immunosuppression. Of course, at that time, immunosuppression was not as it is today. And it was, is rheumatoid arthritis an uncurable disease, so I thought of a real problem, and I thought of perhaps a different way to do it, and I thought about a hand transplant uh, to these patients. And I had not heard about a hand transplant at that time or talked to anybody who had done a hand transplant or have read about um, a hand transplant. Um, then I came after my general surgery residency to do my fellowship in Louisville in hand and microsurgery, and I was, as a fellow, um, one of the people who helped establish the first hand transplant program in the United States and also performed with the team the first hand transplant in the country, uh, who is now Matt on my left, who is the recipient with the longest hand transplant functioning in the world to date. We went on to do our second hand transplant, who is Jerry on my right. Um, and even though at that time we had shown the proof of concept, we can take one person's hand and put it in somebody else's, give immunosuppression, and it survives and is safe. Despite that, the field was disoriented, and then I spent the rest of my career reoriented the field, and what do I mean by that? As developing a new field, there are multiple questions um, to answer. You know, what are the animal models to, you know, study the tissues? Uh, what's the behavior of the tissues, what immunosuppression we can, you know, we can use. So we went ahead and established a high limb transplant in mice, and we do our experiments, and we are testing, we were doing mechanistic studies in these 
type of animal. We also establish a non-human primate model that follows the ethical uh, requirements for ethical experimentation in large animals uh, because the non-human primate is the most relevant, most clinically relevant, into which to translate therapies in transplantation to humans. So we are studying a new medication that has been recently approved, or the last one approved by the FDA called Belatacep. And we have been the first to show that this medication prevents rejections and prolongs survival in this type of in non-human primates. And then we have translated and showed also for the first time that it works in patients who have received hands. As a developing field, we didn't have a common language into which to report and have something that we could relate for with observations of people doing it from all over the world. So we gather investigators from around the world who had done these type of surgeries and through consensus discussions in an international setting, we created a common language for all of us. And today, the classification system for rejection for the field is a standardized worldwide. Something that it was also important to me was the safe implementation of this field. When we started, nobody knew how to call us. So we started to even think about a name and what we use today as vascularized composite allotransplantation transplantation field, it wasn't when we first started. So in 2008, um, HRSA put together a few investigators to talk about this and um, I was invited to that meeting uh, and as inaugural chair of this uh, type of transplant for the American Society of Transplant Surgeons, we recommended the inclusion of this field under the umbrella of transplantation and with a definition as a solid organ transplant. This was in 2008 and then fast forward, uh, the final rule came out in 2013 with adding this as a, another organ transplant, and the OPTN, which is the organization to, that oversees transplant, all transplantation, kidney, liver, in the United States, form a committee to start in, um, writing the, how to implement this field. And I was a member of the inaugural committee. I've been the vice chair, and now I am the chair of the committee now writing the guidelines for the field um, in the United States. This is one of the most complex things you could imagine. And the only way to do it is through a multidisciplinary approach. This is clinical research at its finest. And we have that here at Duke. And when people ask, how big is your team? I said, it's half of Duke. It's the only way to do it. This is a low volume, high risk, high reward type of transplant. But we not only collaborate through half of Duke, but we also collaborate nationally and we lead the consortium for the field uh, with six institutions in the United States that all of the centers are doing clinical as well as preclinical. So we have followed scientific method and scientific principles, but, but let's not forget what these can really do. And I would like um, to share with you and introduce you to one of, of my patients, um, who all of them who, have, who I have mentioned in this talk have given me consent to share their story. Uh, Mr. B uh, was 50 years old, married with a 10-year-old boy, um, and one day he said, you know, I just had like a scratch in my finger and, you know, it's going to pass. And then he started feeling like he had the flu. And then, you know, like perhaps 
many of us would say, oh, it's just a flu, I'll just in three days I will get better. He didn't get better. He, this was an outside facility. He went for medical attention at an outside facility, was referred to an, a larger institution, also at an outside facility. And long story short, it was life over limb. To save his life, he underwent a four-quarter amputation on the left, a bilateral um, lower amputation um, of, of both lower extremities. On the right hand, I had a partial amputation. And the picture that you see there is after over 15 surgeries to try to provide a functional thumb and a functional hand. He heard about our program from another one of my patients and called me um, looking for an option to improve the quality of life. These transplants are quality of life. They're not life-saving. He came, went through a very thorough evaluation. He was unanimously approved uh, to move forward with the hand transplant. And in my conversations with him, I would ask him, Mr. B, why would you want to go through a hand transplant? Um, he has a lot of complications and risk, and he said, there's many things, but I'll tell you some. Um, I, was, I was a coach of the baseball um, team for my son, and I want to throw the ball again. I want to be able to care for my family. I want to be able to go to the restroom on my own. I want to help my wife cook. I want to write and sign my own documents. Um, he went on the waiting list, waiting for a donor, and three days after being on the waiting list, a gracious next of kin donated a hand for him, and we did the transplant on Father's Day. And as he said to me, it's been the best Father's Day present that I've received. Per our protocol, um, per our protocol, these patients stay in the hometown, so they stayed here in, in Durham with us for three months because they have to go through uh, therapy. And uh, this video is just a flip, but as you can see, we match for skin pigmentation, size, as well as sex. And if you didn't know it's a hand transplant, you wouldn't know it's a hand from a donor. And as I tell my patients, as soon as we put the last stitch on that skin, it's your hand. And they, they feel there's a hand because it is their hand. And um, so this was... Um, five weeks after their transplant. Now they, they and that's, we have seen that with, with, with at least all the patients that we've, we've had accumulative, they, um, you know, recover sensation is never gonna be a normal hand. But the question is how better they are compared to how they were before the transplant. So he was here and his wife, they moved here. The, the boy stayed in, you know, in their hometown. Uh, and they stayed for three months. And so at the end of the three months, we were getting ready. They all have an appointment with me the last day. And um, we were going over the therapy at home. Uh, they come every month here for the follow-up, for the medication that we are testing to minimize immunosuppression. And we were getting ready. And then he said, Dr. Sandalis, I have something for you. I think that says it all, you know. Um, and on the same note, um, I want to say that that's the, that's the reason why we do research. And clearly, I cannot stay here without thanking our team, who are an extraordinary group of individuals who do what they do the best, but they all have come together for something larger than the sum of its parts. 
Thank you.